Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Pollard. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School and a professor of molecular cellular and developmental biology. And one of the pleasures of this job is to pick out uh, interesting members of our faculty to address the Company of Scholars lectures. And our lecturer today is uh, Catherine Katie Lofton, who I got to know when she was promoted to associate professor last year. That's my talent scouting activity, <laughs> uh, sitting on all the promotions committees. And she had such a striking, uh, outstanding case. I had to get to know her better, so I'm, I've invited her to give this talk. Uh, Katie is an associate professor of religious studies and of American uh, studies. Uh, she graduated from the University of Chicago with honors in both of those fields uh, in uh, 2000 and received her PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in 2005, and then, I don't know the story, but she wandered around a bit from Reed to Indiana to Princeton uh, before with short stints in each of those I was places. in the desert, just wandering the desert. Yes. Wandering the desert yes. before she came to Yale as an assistant professor in uh, 2009, and she was promoted last year to associate professor in 2012. Uh, so one of the things I learned about her is that she's a fabulous teacher, so I knew she'd be great for this lecture. Uh, the story goes, that, at least in her promotion case, was that she offered a, a, a certain course that ballooned in its second year of offering to be the biggest course in her department overnight. So she must have done something right. Uh, her scholarship uh, is in the area of the history of American religion and the theory of uh, religion and culture. And in, along this line, she's written a, a, a book that's received quite a bit of attention on Oprah, the, the Gospel. Of an, of an icon. That's not what she's going to talk about today. She's going to be talking about religion and the practice of American parenting. Um, and so we're looking forward to remarks. After her remarks, we'll have a question and answer period, and then we'll have a reception in the common room next door. Katie. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, uh, you're like the William Morris of Yale University right now. I'm really honored to get to do this. and. Um, I'm going to talk today about a subject that uh, I've been working on for about a year. Um, it's a project that's really unfurling for me. Um, and I would really welcome in the Q&A comments, things that you free associate. Uh, this is the beginning to me of an argument. Um, as my students know, I have a problem with speaking very, very quickly. And so if I don't try to restrict myself through the prose on the page, you will have a very hard time tracking my excess. So to that end, I use the mechanism of PowerPoint as sort of a highlights reel to accompany alongside my own excessive verbosity. The subject I want to talk to you today uh, is, is in some ways very much connected to all the subjects that I'm into. These are all subjects on which I have written at some point or another. And in some ways, there's this kind of excessive multiplicity to the thing that I am venturing in. In this multiplicity, I am trying to name the religious now. I work simultaneously against the secularization thesis and within it, as I am invested in the naming of certain perpetual desires and social forms as religious, while I'm also a scholar of what is not perpetual. How Americans are religious now is quite different than they were in 1890, yet I argue we are all still religious. Naming what remains and what has changed is my work. So I am here to study what focuses our existence, what defines our concept of the social, and what drives us to differentiating rituals and identities. This vocabulary is, I argue, that of the study of religion. What makes the study of religion somewhat different, those, since those previous attributes could be assigned to sociology or philosophy, but I argue what is different about religion, the study of it, the practice of it, is the obsession with the other. Religions describe and define relationships established among groups, among individuals, between self and supernatural authority. Religion names relationships between self and gods, one might say. Rather than take up an exegesis today of that particular term religion, however, and I would say in the majority of my scholarship, my interest in less in theorizing the object religion to begin than to take another object, seemingly either far flung or, or somewhat proximate but different, and look at that. So today the object I want to nominate because I think it's usefully brought into a conversation on the religious now is parenting. The history of parenting is a relatively recent history of inquiry. 
since parenting as a self-conscious practice of cultivation is an artifact of modernity. Prior to the 20th century, the verb to parent appeared very rarely in the English lexicon. As a noun, it referred almost exclusively to a genealogical description. Before the 19th century, few invocations of parenting as a practice of cultivation exist, with an exponential increase in such usage after the 1920s. What I want to talk about is how this shift took place, under what terms. At the most generic level, we can agree that the parent is an emblem of modernity, insofar as parenting is a matrix through which individuals reckon with the concepts of individuality, social participation, and moral consciousness. Despite the rich terrain for cultural observation that parenting practices offer, parenting is a very strange lacuna in humanist analysis. There is a scholarly literature about published childcare advice, about the changing role of the mother, about the social history of the family, and the cultural meaning of the child. Yet there is very little about the concepts of parental control or practices of parenting. Within US religious history, scholars have paid very little attention to the religious dimensions of modern family life, despite the practical and ideological connections between religious ideation and concepts of parental authority. In general, there seems to be a sense that religion, particularly Protestant Christianity in America, once played a very powerful job and role in the work of parenting, but that religion largely disappeared from homes in the close, at the close of the Victorian era. According to the majority of historical accounts, religion within the family, like religion within the rest of modernity, disappeared in a presumptive secularization. Such a narrative depends on certain sociologies of religion, including those that emphasize church attendance or creedal adherence to prove a declension. Yet I want to reimagine today with you the history of parenting as a document of religion in a broader sense, one that emphasizes how parenting and the formation of a family unit defined by its practice has increasingly become the definitive religious focus of 20th and 21st century Americans. Persistent throughout the documentary evidence prescribing American parenting practice is authority. Descriptions of the authority of parents and the meaning of that authority for the propagation of the right society. To be sure, Romans and Vikings parented, Shakespeare's England had parents, but in the American context, parenting becomes an elaborate discursive regime, a scientia parentis, this is me, that propounded a potent identity for its practitioners and a social politics for everybody to debate due in no small part to the country's colonial origins and its overthrow of them, due in no small part to its relationship to parents, parenting became a telling subject in the new nation. As Alexis de Tocqueville observed of America in 1840, when the social state becomes democratic and men adopt as a general principle that it is good and legitimate to judge all things in relation to oneself, <laughs> taking old beliefs as information and not as rule, the power of opinion that a father exerts over his son diminishes, as does his legal power. De Tocqueville here speaks about the diminishing potency of the father in, the, in America. Elsewhere in his text, as some of you know, he writes about America's multiplying and to him quite strange excessive religious communities. I link these two subjects, fading forms of patriarchy, increasing forms of religious creativity, as bound together. Unfettered from mother churches and fatherlands, America instantiated parental authority in a prescriptive excess. When authority is diffuse, even invisible, it must be constructed to exist. To observers of the nascent country, America was a vast frontier that lacked the scaffolding of coherent authority. Parenting and the literatures which emphasize its importance offered maps to this seemingly, wrongly, mapless terrain. To be clear, of course, at any given time, parenting might be manifested in any number of ways. At any given time, few parents would hew neatly to some prescriptive document. What I want to underline is not a phenomenological truth, but an ontological one. Namely, that parents become the manifestation of authority, and recommendations about parenting were recommendations about proper self-governance within such an open atmosphere. 
And as critics of religion and psychologists of the family have suggested, the parental relation can easily be figured analogously to the religious relation. An indicative 1882 treatise on moral education of children, American psychologist G. Stanley Hall would write in a much longer rhapsodic passage, which I here abbreviate, the mother's face and voice are the first conscious objects as the infant soul unfolds, and she soon comes to stand in the very place of God to her child. Hall believed that in infancy, individuals developed a relationship to their nurturing adults akin to that of divine care. Inferred from such an observation is an ongoing corollary between the parental relationship and subsequent divine engagement in that infant's life. In the history of psychology, the parent often represents a divine proxy. A just parent, like a just God, would inspire individuals to ascend beyond the primitive projections of a retributive authority and instead pursue the good by their own well-trained compass. All of this developmental theology occurs around American cribs while authority itself is declining as a meaningful religious concept. Here we see Barbara Defoe Whitehead, Vice President of the Conservative Institute for American Values, who observed in 1995, there has been a debunking of leaders in our society, a turning away from clergy and religious institutions. And while Whitehead has a tendentious view, an unhappy view, of this epistemological observation, I agree with it sociologically, and it seems right to me to describe the relationship between religious institutions and the religious believer in America as a disobedient one, so much so that disobedience itself defines the permeable frames of our religious experience. One way to summarize this is to say that religious believers in America have become less orthodox. Not that there are fewer self-identified religious adherents, but that the religions themselves have become less invested in questions of heresy and dogma. For example, surveys over the last 50 years have documented the diminishment in certain forms of retributive deities. Three quarters, 75% of adolescents in 1961 believe that God punished people who sin. This statistic fell by 1975 to slightly more than half. And today, the numbers of Americans who believe God is a punishing agent active in their existence is statistically negligible. What I want to point to today is how certain forms of divine, ecclesiastical, and religious authority have diminished while parental work and responsibility seem to have increased. There has been a persistent relationship between religious ideation and parental religious practice in the 20th century. One sociologist did a massive study of this uh, in, in the mid-1990s, and he found that 75% of Protestants left their churches during late adolescence, sort of pubescent rebellion against their father churches. But then he remarked, having children is the number one impetus people then have for returning or coming back to their church or synagogue. 49% of those same surveyed returned to church in their late 30s in response to having had children. A 2007 survey by Parents Magazine agreed finding that 64% of parents interviewed claimed that they were more religious slash spiritual since becoming a parent. These examples offer a kind of suggestive sociology of American parenting and its spiritual connotations. A sense of a need for something else to be there as I do this thing so concentrated. In the remaining space of this talk, I'm going to consider connections between the religious history of the United States and its cultural ideologies of parenting. And as I do this, I'm not going to refer a lot to the way that um, sectarian groups prescribe very particular parenting strategies. For example, uh, like the Latter-day Saint recommendation of a family home evening, or the Hindu practice of talking about Vedic precepts during everyday life. Instead, what I want to do is consider the way parenting is figuring centrally and discussions of American life, especially as Americans struggle with the questions of what kind of individual will be the most successful in changing religious imperatives and market concerns. Parenting concerns all the biggest issues of existence. Otherness, community, freedom, responsibility, critique, interpretation, love. What I want to track is how we came to embrace parenting as one of the richest discursive spaces for the consideration of these questions in public. I will move through an account of the history of parenting at a clip previously unseen. 
that gathers its conceits into interpretive clusters, including, we're, we're on a hustle, people, and we're going to go from colonial, Republican, hygienic, industrial, and service, rapidly moving to the present in an effort to try to provide summary descriptions from various literatures, uh, educational, moral, scientific, creating, uh, they slip into a kind of um, fantasy ascription. What can we really know from such a fantasy ascription, from a kind of description of the ideal parent? What we know is something very spectral. I, I'm, I'm mindful as a historian of what can we know from a manual of existence? Pretty much nothing to the actuality of existence. Yet I think we can know quite a great deal about the spectral concept of the terms of my adjudication. Notably absent, yet present in a way that we will see, is the rich material and consequential racial history of parenting, a history that would necessarily include the invocation of Native American relocation, slave families, immigrants and refugees, as well as the specific analyses of differential access to the very institutional and governmental resources I will be highlighting as supporting these sort of icons and ideologies. This is a story that does not tell those stories. This is as typical in the beginning of a plot. This is a story that focuses on a bourgeois mentality that I make iconic of the story that plots us from Catherine Beecher to Miss Anne Romney and G. Stanley Hall to Mr. Dr. James Dobson. This is a broad genealogy of a collective, largely white will about parenting in America. If the absence of parents defined the beginning of American history, parental presence defined in various ways American success and the moral consequences of that success from the 18th century to the 21st. And now we begin. In the 17th and 18th century America, etiquette manuals and moral treatises constantly seem to define and liken the relationship between parents and children in hierarchical terms quite reminiscent of the colonial relationship. Here are two quotations. 1712, Benjamin Wadsworth writes, children should patiently wear and grow better by the needful chastisements and corrections their parents give them. A 1768 treatise said <laughs> to children, grumble not nor be discontented at anything thy parents appoint, speak, or do. Parents had one job, to break the will of their children so that they would become adults who would sacrifice their personal desires for the good of the larger circles of authority they occupied, including those of family, church, king, and country. British colonists did not interpret individualism or ambition as positive aspects of a child's disposition to be fostered. Rather, they believed that children were innately sinful and required the controlling authority of a parent to teach them self-discipline. A revolution in parenting transpired simultaneously with the American Revolution. In the early national period, our contemporary conceptions of child nurture began to take shape, as John Demos wrote significantly about, and children were increasingly understood to be less sinful. Indeed, children began to be enchanted by a parental dynamic bent upon pressing the family into political significance. Catherine Beecher, one of the foremost theorists of 19th century domesticity, female and otherwise, dedicated her 1869 volume, The American Woman's Home, to, this is her language, the women of America, in whose hands rest the real destinies of the republic. Mothers directed Republican parenting. As fathers guided Republican economic independence, each one relied on the other for its perpetuation. Despite this clarity about the natal importance of the American home, the available child rearing manuals offered a set of very conflicting demands to parents, a pattern to be continued. Parents were told, teach your children to submit to a Christian conscience. At the same time, circulating cultural images emphasize the importance of free market savvy, and as one of them said, a fierce will for American success. From the standpoint of religious history, this contradictory endorsement of individual independence and Christian obedience can be seen across the American landscape, as schismatic sects formed by the month and non-denominational evangelical benevolent societies increased in number and size. A new circulating interdenominational concept of national Christianity became a form of authoritarian speech that inspired everything from the new enshrinement of the mother as a societal arbiter to the abolitionist arguments focused on the terrifying domestic familial displacements of enslavement. Such a presumptively Christian configuration for family life was not met with universal acclaim. 
many, if not all, 19th century communitarian critiques of existent religious authority, like those supplied by the Latter-day Saints, the Rappites, the United Perfectionists, all included centrally indictments of this nuclear family and its norms for sexual practice and gender identity. Across the country, individuals resisted this new Protestant American rectitude in favor of experimenting with very relatively new prescriptions about right parents, families, marriages. Whatever parental authority that Christian observers prescribed to quell indulgent sensibilities, there was also an equal cultural tug to encourage rebellion in that marvelously Republican child, as seen in the multiple depictions of the impish child pulling pranks on mom, dad, servants, whatnot. And the confused results were deemed to be thoroughly American from one European observer. Parents love their children as dearly and intensely as Europe, but exercise less control, less authority. American parents are far more forbearing, nay, meeker with their children than they are in Europe. The invention of this Republican nurturing parent had not, it seemed, produced a child willing to be controlled. If Republican parenting sought to instantiate a right citizen, lively, wakeful, angry, ready, hygienic parenting sought to construct the developmental apex of civilization. Children ought to receive the very best that science had to offer, and they ought too to embody physically and morally the very best humankind, humankind can be. In practice, these two forces, moral and scientific, were much more overlapping than oppositional. For example, in the book, the Christian family psychologist George Walk Walker Fist argued for a child-centered home that was run by, his language, constructive discipline. This home would include a regular family council, as well as regular times for prayer, worship, instruction. When he was trying to reach, though, for a metaphor to describe this ideal familial community, Fisk wrote that the home was, his language, a laboratory, a place where children could daily observe different practices of religion and learn the right ones through godly parenting. The home became a scientific laboratory due in part to the permeating effect of the child study movement. Led by American psychologist G. Stanley Hall, the child study movement sought to enlist large numbers of ordinary citizens in a broad effort to deepen both public and scientific understanding of human development. The child study movement offered critical data for the advocacies of the social purity and the social hygiene movements, which connected concepts of moral virtue to physical practices. These movements included the distribution of bathing manuals to new immigrant communities, political arguments on behalf of birth control, campaigns to outlaw prostitution, and eugenics propositions. During the turn from the 19th to the 20th centuries, scientists became more engaged in the public sphere. In the wake of World War I, scientific evidence became the critical component of any federal legislative action. Moral hygiene laws evinced a Christian moralism still at work in American jurisprudence, offering new sociological and medical data as a kind of social perfectionism that might resolve the bodies of all those unwashed masses coming to shore. This is when we can see a scientia parentis becoming thoroughly identifiable. A rash of new child rearing manuals began to appear in the United States in the 1920s. As one prominent historian of the American family has argued, the 20th century, described as the century of the child, became, their language, a century of anxiety about the child and the parent's own anxiety. The number of agencies and manuals devoted to children and their proper care increased exponentially. As the author of Religious Education of the Family described, today's parents, are becoming more and more interested in the rational performance of high duties. And, formed, and they're forming associations in church, Christian associations, women's clubs, and institutes are studying the subject. There is a general desire for guidance. This organizational development surrounding the subject of parenting reflected the expanding national culture of education, the incursion of therapeutic idiom in all of public life, and the formation of federal agencies to nurture and monitor human welfare. Hygienic parenting was a very potent discourse, one that identified the child as a primitive subject to be developed into a civilized adulthood in a process of recapitulation evocative of the very worst excesses of social Darwinism. Yet these arguments would not persist in precisely that form. The scientism became an excess and a rebuttal emerged, as happens in every transition. 
in my plot. As historian Martha Wolfenstein has spoken about, the transition in the 1920s and 1930s was that there was a transformation in the conception of the child that was a rebuttal against this kind of endless measuring and monitoring of the child's particularity. This is her language. Where formerly the mother was to exercise a ceaseless vigilance, removing the thumb from the child's mouth as often as he put it in, now she is told, Wolfenstein explains, not to make a fuss, to let the child act without interruption. If hygienic parents had required the persistent correction and moral devotion to the, phys the physical development of your child, the new iteration of parenting recommended, offered a kind of mandate that the parent not merely raise their child carefully, particularly with great detail, but also that the parent take pleasure in their child, naughty or nice. Parenting became, and this is Wolfenstein's locution, a practice of fun morality. The test of your parenting was no longer your child, but whether you lived a life devoted to the fabulous enjoyment of your child. If Republican parenting emphasized the creation of able citizens, and hygienic parenting molded civilized subjects, industrial parents focused their energies on creating a massive population of capitalist consumers who could outnumber, outspend any Cold War enemy. The industrial parent used the exponentially increasing array of consumer packaged goods to tend to every part of a child's physicality and intellectual development. They were handmaidens of the military industrial complex, transferring the post-war productivity to a very intimate home front. Following World War II, it seemed that everything in the American landscape existed to foster children and their parents. Tracked homes, automobiles, highway infrastructure, in-home furnishings, public schools, industry worked overtime to supply the material context for the materialization of this, the definitive baby boom. Countless incentives from federally financed mortgages to tax deductions supported the establishment of nuclear families with children. The birth rate rose among all social, occupational, economic, and ethnic groups in a remarkable consensus of reproductive behavior. Communities like Levittown, Pennsylvania earned the nicknames Fertility Valley and the Rabbit Hutch to describe their natal excess. Although the baby boom was fueled in part by the post-war economic boom, it also resulted in a profound change in the national political culture. Parenthood now became an absorbing creative profession, a career second to none, wrote one writer in 1946. This is a very signal transition in my historical account as it is when exterior authorities, moral and hygienic, become internalized by the parents. When Dr. Spock remarked, trust yourself, you know more than you think you do, he effectively concluded the era of hygienic parenting, turning from outside scientific authorities toward the analysis of their own maternal and paternal feelings. This did not, however, diminish the role of parenting manuals or their authors, Rather, it's going to elaborate the role of the author as an interpretive guide to those unexplored parental feelings. As families lived in increasingly atomized physical settings, child rearing manual met authors became virtual village elders, boon companions, and confessors to those who bought their texts and considered the application of their complex recommendations. To me, this is a very significant transition in the history of self and other. The parenting guru, Spock or otherwise, existed mainly to help the parent to help themselves to see what it is the child wanted most to be and to do. The purpose of parenting was to come to understand your child as they were, not to compel them to formal rules or abstract metrics. For 52 years, sales of Dr. Benjamin Spock's baby and child care were second only to the Bible in the United States. This engagement with a child was, Spock argued, the absolute highest calling, him. Taking care of their children, seeing them grow and develop into fine people gives most parents, despite the hard work, their greatest satisfaction in life. It is a creative and generative act on every level. Pride in otherworldly accomplishments usually pales in comparison. In the world of Dr. Spock, there is no such thing as a willful child. There is only a misunderstood child. His handbook included short recommendations usually only two to three paragraphs in length, about every conceivable child care question, posed often, and some of you probably know this, as a series of questions to the parent. This passage, I'm about to show you a passage, I'm like building up to a reveal. Um, if you haven't seen it, you're just in for a treat today. So 
every, as you read this passage, keep in mind that to me what's interesting about it is um, it's sort of a hum, that the text has a kind of hum that I would, I would myself want to very much liken to meditative transitions, but we'll hold that back for the Q&A. For right now, notice the responsibilities of the parent, the kind of interactions that are made ideal between parent and child, the critical role material goods play in the management of a child's disposition, and the question, who is the boss? Frequent tantrums are most often due to the fact that the parents haven't learned the knack of handling this behavior tactfully. If your child is having frequent temper tantrums, ask yourself the following questions. Does she have plenty of chance to play freely outdoors? Are there things for her to push and pull and climb on there? Indoors, has she enough toys and household objects to play with? And is the house childproofed? Do you, without realizing it, arouse bulkiness by telling her to come and get her shirt on instead of slipping it on without comment? Or asking her if she wants to go to the bathroom instead of leading her there or bringing the potty to her? When you have to interrupt her to play to get her indoors or meals, do you frustrate her directly or get her mind on something pleasant? When you see a storm brewing, do you meet it head on, grimly, or do you distract her to something else? Time and again, Spock's ideas were described rhapsodically with enormous relief as common sense. And they quickly pervaded the landscape. Parents referred to their children as Spock babies with pride. A poll of more than 1,000 new mothers found that 64% of them had read Baby and Child Care 30 years after the book was released. Of this group, four of every five referred to the book at least twice a month. Doctors and insurance agents gave it away for free well into the 70s with every birth. Dr. Spock becomes a national paterfamilias whose wisdom emanates from a kind of set of commandments. He argued that parents could achieve enlightenment through the admirable patience and quiet labor of submissive parenting. Spock was the ideal mouthpiece for industrial parenting. His parent was the assembly line laborer possessing a stoic constancy before a job described as necessary, necessarily hard, but constantly revelatory. Not everybody affirmed Spock's view. Conservative columnist Stuart Alsop complained that an entire generation was spocked when they should have been spanked. <laughs> Later, evangelical psychologist James Dobson would author his book titled Dare to Discipline as a countermeasure to the leniency he identified in Spock. Debate about parental authority was a debate in part about what political arrangement the practitioner preferred. During the late 20th century, conservative political leaders increasingly aligned themselves with conservative religious leaders developing an argument about family life and family values that was, they claimed, a metonym for right governance. Meanwhile, an expanding parade of childcare gurus would offer nurturing descriptions of children for working mothers and fathers trying to cultivate right relations with their child as they also sought to survive the changing market world. The industrial parent had produced a generation of children appropriate to the increasingly consumer republic and a generation of children disaffected from any other authority other than their own. The late 20th century parent was, is, we'll talk about that in the Q&A, in service to the child, managing and strategizing every aspect of their person to maximize their market potential. During the 1990s, several critical economic and demographic shifts took place that would affect the practice of parenting, including the rampant expansion of American higher education, the outsourcing of industry, and the corresponding transition to an information economy, and profound reapportionments of gender demographics in all occupations. With an increase in standards of living and educational access, American children live lives of profound material plenty when compared to their historical predecessors. This improvement in children's lives led to an escalation of the minimal standard for a child's well-being. Meanwhile, the ubiquity of mass entertainment brought new anxieties about cultural experience and mental development, and the decline in child labor raised questions about the function and identity of children. Depending on your vantage, and this is a quote, uh, two quotes, contemporary American kids may represent the most indulged people in the history of the world, or they may be understood as the most pressured young people in the history of the world. Certainly parents have been figured as responsible for the results of this excess and as one child psychologist commented, never before have parents been so convinced that their every move has a ripple effect into their child's future success. Concomitant to these shifts in children's culture were significant alterations in religious life. More and more Americans identified themselves as spiritual, not religious. 
an incantation that included both those free thinking participants in the New Age movement and attendance at non denominational Christian services. What unites a very diverse spectrum of believers is the disavowal of denomination. For more and more Americans, being religious meant something disconnected from institutions and authorities. The practice of religion is now a looser concept comprised of reading groups, therapeutic practices, and a combinatory of sectarian ideas. A 1995 article, for example, in Parents Magazine outlined the spiritual values, Parents a relatively <laughs> secular outfit, spiritual values that every parent should insert into family activities. Here's the list. Select a congregation that matches your family's needs and personality. Set aside some time every week for sacred family time. Teach kids tolerance. Introduce your children to different faiths by taking them to interfaith services or activities in your community. Answer big questions directly. And finally, when children ask about good and evil, birth or death, don't reply with a complicated theological response. <laughs> These values do not belong to any single creed. They seem to be presented as the generally agreed upon moral middle of a presumptively plural society. And so, as the terms of parental success were increasingly narrowed to educational ascendance, the terms of religious articulation became purposefully vaguer, determined by the needs of the believer and the needs of the whole family. Another article in another parenting magazine described that the most successful churches and synagogues envision their congregations not as a center for theological debate or discussion, or as a center for ritual practice, but as, the language, a hub for a network of families. Churches will not succeed if they focus on theology or doctrine. They succeed if they provide activities that meet the needs of young families, and not, this article concludes, the other way around. Within this culture of religious fluidity and parental ambition, a very strange subject of parenting took center stage very briefly in the mid to late 90s. Since the 1970s, the divide between parent-centered practice and child-centered practice was increasingly determined by a presumptive religious identity. Child-centered proselytizers like Barry Bravelton and Penelope Leach were avowedly secular advocates of parental practices of listening, loving, learning, interacting. Whereas the self-proclaimed Judeo-Christian experts such as James Dobson and William Damon loudly condemned what they saw as the decadent state of American culture, arguing for a disciplining parent in an era of service parenting. This dichotomy achieved notoriety in the 1990s when the corporal punishment of children became a topic of heated social and political debate. A massive scholarly effort replied to data that suggested conservative Protestants were more likely than other parents to value obedience from their children and use corporal punishment to do so. Spanking, in particular, became a public object. A state of emergency took place in reply as scholars scrambled to assemble evidence from research on the physical discipline of children to prove that corporal punishment was ineffective at deterring child misbehavior, and that children subjected to corporal punishment tended to be more aggressive with peers than children who experienced alternative forms of discipline. What to me is very peculiar about this blip of reactive social science is twofold. First, the available empirical evidence did not suggest that Christian parents did, in fact, use corporal punishment, only that some of their child care manuals recommended that a light tap on the bottom could get what you wanted. Second, and more importantly, the broader demography of American religion, largely turning as it was away from such modes, made coverage of this kind of marginal biblical readings very disproportionate to the sociological real. Yet if early 20th century social scientists sought to combine moral programming with scientific recommendation, late 20th century social scientists seemed bent upon exiling all forms of religion from cultural practice, as if religion was the last false authority left to the liberation of the happy and healthy parent. But the parent can't be so easily freed. And the problem of parenting didn't go away if corporal punishment was itself largely, as it was in the public sphere, reviled. Perhaps this reaction to marginal Protestant parental practice was a red herring. In the late 1990s, parents and experts struggled with much bigger dramas as there were an increased incidence of violence enacted by children and teenagers. Talk of spanking Protestants may have been a kind of convenient sacrificial object for a public lacking answers about the expansion in youth pharmacology, the increase in school shootings, juvenile depression, and diagnosis of ADD and ADHD.
If religion could just be the culprit, then the cure could be simple, less religion, more parenting. If religion wasn't the only problem, then giving all the existing literature on child nurture for all of those problems, ADHD, violence, parents had only themselves to blame. Looking back from this era of service parenting to those that preceded it, it's possible to make several now broad claims about the relationship between religion and American parenting. At the same time that there has been, I argue, a diminishment in creedal orthodoxies, the expectations of what it means to be a parent have become more orthodox. Not that parents are more religious, but that more people are treating parenting religiously. Relatedly, there are more areas of imagined perfection within the frame of child development. Of course, no parent can claim to be comprehensive or ideal in their parenting, but all parents would speak now of parenting as an occupational force in their lives. Being a parent today isn't just a component of existence, but an ordering fact of it, one which seems to press at the limits of sanity, wellness, time, budget, ability. Parenting has become the determinative calling for late modern adults. Examples from the disputes often electoral of summer 2012 illustrate the contradictory positions held within this new landscape of nurturance. During that time, it was difficult to avoid the subject of parenting, largely exhibited through the complicated and fraught figure of the mother. Here are two, um, two quotations from both of the candidates' wives speaking about the centrality of their motherhood as their capacity to lead. In the early 20th century, the elements of infant nurture have gone decidedly public, including entire economies, psychologies, and lobbies dividing the world between good and bad parents, depending on the practices that they pursue. Amid the din of debate, though, about toddler breastfeeding and supermothers, about nannies and quality time, about the new slacker dads and the old midwifery, I am trying to nominate all of these topics as topics for the study of religion. Because to me, there's one hum of truth in all of these subjects, that practicing parenting is central to the American moral life, determinative of the American moral imagination. In the mid-1990s, Parents Magazine surveyed more than 7,700 7, readers and found that there was a universal agreement that teaching children was the practical way to make a lasting contribution to society. Elaine Tyler May, a historian who's written quite a bit on childlessness, worries about this. She writes, Many Americans believe that the only place they can find true happiness is in private life. This belief places an overwhelming burden, as well as an overwhelming sense of experience, expectation, on individual procreative behavior as determinative of the moral life. In a moment in which the public sphere seems unwieldy and maybe undisciplined, being a parent seems perhaps the only way to change the world. A religious history of American parenting shows that there has not been a secularization of the American family in which religion has increasingly absented itself. Instead, this history shows that parenting provides a mode of religious expression. If religious orthodoxy is understood as a submission of individuals to a comprehensive theological system, parental orthodoxy could be conceived as a submission of individuals to the work of parenting as determining the lives of its practitioners. The home, I argue, has not become merely a replacement for the church. It has become the genesis of the secular that defines our religious world. Scholarship that tries to tackle the embodied, material, and social facts of this dynamic would offer not only portraits of the history of the family, but also, I think, key exhibits in the history of religion. Thank you so much. I would be. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, really enjoyed the talk, especially the, the uh, conclusion, the sort of one of your, your big pieces at the end. Yeah. I really like that. Um, one thing that I, I'm not sure that the analogy extends perfectly, and you can probably convince me otherwise, is uh, religion has been forever embodied as a uh, community. Right. Uh, yes. And I don't talk to my neighbor. Right. On, you know, we don't meet weekly to discuss how I'm going to raise my kids. So yes. Is that completely gone, or am I not thinking of it correctly? No, that's a great question. So, I mean, this project for me very much came out of, I, I wrote this book about Oprah Winfrey, where um, many people would look at Oprah and just say, well, that's just narcissism. That can't be religion, because it's self-help. 
and the New Age. And so Oprah's famous for propounding all these spiritual observers who guide her and only her through her problems. And through watching her, you learn how to take care of yourself. And as I was watching the show and talking about it and its relationship to religious history, the thing that also worried me or concerned me was precisely this absence of community. Sometimes Oprah's show would create book clubs around it. Sometimes it would lead to women meet and watch the show, but pretty rarely. It was largely individual self-betterment. And the question of community seemed to be sort of hanging spectrally over the entire 20th century in, in the study of religion. How do we solve the problem of precisely what you're saying, which is, I don't talk to my neighbor, right? In the history of philosophy, let's all start weeping. I don't talk to my neighbor. You're right, but we do talk obsessively, investedly, with the question of these children, my spouse and partner. The practice of making this family, I am trying to argue, I think, is, and this is where the critique is suggested and not finished, increasingly the site of devotion and the question of its interconnectedness to a broader community, you're saying that might make it more real religion. And I would say that might make it right religion. But I'm interested in talking about the habitus of that family as the form of community that we're now most conscious of. That's a very sharp thing to say. And there can be many replies of, well, I go to this synagogue. I do this kind of activism. We do this Habitat for Humanity as Baptists, as family members. But I'm trying to say, what's the primal social unit of contemporary Americans, I would argue it's not some concept of community, it's the family. And so in that I am trying to definitely take up the very rough edge of that question you're asking, which is what's the con consciousness of community in that? And as I'm quoting Elaine Tyler May, I'm trying to raise, is this good, is this bad? How do we feel about that? Do we think that this is a way of political, as I, I think May is overtly saying this is the end of politics. It's, it's the beginning of something very worrisome. Or is she totally wrong because, as we see, the kids' wives use it to interesting effect. We see both Michelle Obama and Ann Romney lassoing their vocabulary of motherhood to have political projects. What do we think of those? Um, in any event, so that's precisely the kind of observation that I'm trying to react to and think about. And, and so thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, along that line, as church and synagogue attendance has declined, yeah. um, you have the information age narrative where people are morally judging each other. And oh, my God. Yep, mommy and blogs. Yep. And then you have the mommy work, mm -hmm. breastfeeding, no breastfeeding, work, no work, and, and it, it becomes very violent. Yes. And very, very acrimonious. And, um, Absolutely. And so one of the things I like to, and the, there's religious historians in there who could talk about this. Um, when you study the history of religions, it's not a lot of people like, oh, you're so pious. No, you're so pious. It's a lot of, you're not pious, and you're less pious. So the history of religions is filled with a kind of cruel observation of how that person manages the Eucharist, whether or not they're as enthusiastic as they need to be, how regularly do they daven. So there is a kind of cruel estimation in the history of religions, too. And I precisely want to get at, um, my friend sent me these crazy blogs in New York where they're posing questions. They just depicted this in the last 30 Rock, where they show, do you know the name of those? There's, they're, they're blogs where you basically go on. I'm sorry, urban baby. And you, there are all these acronyms, and they're basically asking material questions that then lead to these massive debates. But the reason why I love these, and this is going to be part of my um, media ethnography for this project, is they really get to some intense issues. It starts with this sort of total banality and grotesque materialism, but it often falls out to statements about self and other, about family, about right life, about good, bad people. You might be disgusted by the values propounded, but I'm at least excited that values are being debated, that people are getting to a point in the, some form of a public and saying, what would be the right way to have a human being in the world? What is a human being in the world? So there's, often we have, a, I do, have kind of underbelly of, ah, you know, but there's also an excitement that at least a debate occurs. So yeah, this, this question of social media, is that what kind of community does social media propound is a very rich question. Yeah, Birgit. In parenting, Absolutely. yes, as opposed to in scholarship or in gendered performance, but their yeah, dogma yeah. appears, so yes. Like yes. Freedom, so right, exactly. yeah. Right. 
Yes. Which were These dissenting, about yes. How crazy they were, mm -hmm. while treasuring every moment of the other. Yes. So my, my methodological question yeah. is, how do, you, do, do you, how do you get to those? Because those seem Right, to the dissenting forms, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's great. And to me, there's, there's a couple different forms of dissenting culture, and I'll be efficient because I want to take some other questions. But I love that question. I want to talk about it because to me, dissent is often articulated through two different modes. One is uh, the kind of the one you just described, a kind of hipster, bite back onion. And there's a history of that in America. But the other form of dissent, which I'm obviously invested in as a scholar of religion, is uh, revivals of other kinds of orthodoxy. So that's why you can see me kind of being interested in James Dobson. Here, not as my, my, my colleague, Lou Gravifus Bailey, has written a lot about Dobson and his role and why he talks about parenting the way he does. And here's not the licensed Dobson. Dobson is disturbing. To read him in excess is to travel the mind of a person who truly hates human beings. But, <laughs> but he has taken on, just like the Mormons did, just they take on the question that there's something very normatively disturbing about all these mothers have to enjoy parenting all the time. You have to enjoy Joy, every part of it. First of all, it's exhausting. Second of all, it's a duty. So then he runs to duty. He says, you cannot have to feel so bad about not enjoying it all the time. You treat it like a good Christian duty. I like that alternative of a new vocabulary of hermeneutic, even though, in the end, I'm not going to side with him interpretively. So yes, I'm trying to find sources for dissent. I welcome those. If you want to send me those links, I, I, I'm collecting. I'm at a collecting stage. So I, I love the, the spaces where people can bite back against the normative supp suppositions of sentimental joy, which is so often attributed to this plot. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, well, I was I was going to ask a very theoretical question about your definition of religion. Yeah. I, in the religious, because I tend to get uncomfortable when people define religion very broadly. Yeah. As I think you do, but I, I want to ask a much more banal question now. Yeah. What What do you make of the vehement and and sort of surprising to me right wing reaction to Michelle Obama's initiatives with regard to healthy eating and going outside? I mean, these seem like very sort of common sense and yes. traditional American kind of parenting things. Is there a racial dynamic? Is there a class dynamic? We yes. have this liberal, you know, this uh, you know, liberal educated black woman telling us to eat kale and everything. You know. Right. I think you're very much on the plot line I would go on. <laughs> and then I would just add that the exteriority, one of so I can and as as my students we 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 talk about Michelle Obama and my class on religion and sexuality because it's such a beautiful example of Foucault's description of biopower because she's really trying to say a healthy population looks this way and feels this way and, and gives prescriptions for it. But the thing that's to me incredibly admirable about the plot and I think is therefore upsetting to Christian is it takes people so outside. It's takes them into communities and mixes them together. The fear that these terrains are unpoliced. Unpoliced mixing is a huge concern for most religious communities. What will happen if we are not being more regulated and using public spaces? It seems to, one of the blogs I saw on this point just in researching for my class lecture was one that's just worried about community gardens as socialist spaces. So one can imagine, you know, you can get to it. You, your analysis is already there. I just want to land really quickly though. He raised at the beginning this question of the definition of religion, which for those of you who are not in the study of religion, do not know how many pages, hours, lives have been lost on the wars of defining religion. And I did absolutely, the brother was was right, say I did a very general, which is something about religion is concerning the question of self and other. And I do that because so much time, I, my, one version of this talk opened by saying, I'm a person who really loves Paul Tillich's definition of religion, where he talks about his ultimate concern, and I love sociological definitions like Durkheim's, where he gets hyperactive about what's an actual community, what do they have, what objects do they have. So I am fascinated by both forms of study of religion, one which tries to get at the things I feel deeply about with large groups of people, that's religion. And the other groups that are trying to be more technical about it, this is the four elements you need. That's a religion. And I tend to think in contemporary American culture that the technicology of the second is going to keep you out of studying much as religious anymore. We really do run into, because of precisely the first question, the elements that you need to find a religious life, the kinds of numbers and community, that the people who define a, a relationship to religion, it's hard, it's hard to find those kind of classic objects, community, creed, code, cultist. So I'm interested in trying to figure out what, what spaces of religion exist now, given those kinds of changes. I, I mean, I, I just, yeah. you know, the, only, the only reason I bring that up is because like, I, I tend to worry that sometimes talking about religion in these more sociological ways of you know, concern for the sacred and yeah. community and values and stuff can sort of confuse people when you, when you say that, like, oh, religion is still important in families when, like, you know the the, the secularization, secularization hypothesis that you seem you know to right. be rejecting in a sort of literal sense of what most people think of as religion 
you know, seems to be true. Right, and my own so position would be that there's, like, that in the history of religions, what people think about religion that way is a very short history, 1910 to like 1960. So when you're talking about religion that way, there's a very short period of time where people thought about religion in that way. I'm a Lutheran, very short window of history. And otherwise, it's a much, as historians in the room can all speak about, it's about a way of life, it's integrated into daily practice, or it's really complicated and combinatory. But the story and the definition of religion was encapsulated by a particular mode, which all of us could then narrate the history of social science in that time period, incorporating American communities, the exclusion of other communities. So anyway, it's a great question. Many classes taught. Some people in this room don't find it as exciting as you and me. But, um, <laughs> but does anyone ask any other questions? Any last question? Yes, Ms. Rabin. Mm -hmm. talk. Um, you talk a lot about parenting, parents, family, um, and obviously these are also sort of contested, politicized terms. And yeah. I'm also just interested in their relationship, like the par parent as an identity versus the, the talk is called the practice of mm -hmm. parenting and the family as the habitus. So just some reflection on those categories and their relationships. Yeah, which one would you like me to focus on? Yeah, so the, the word that when you come up in the dictionary of parenting, most often the language of cultivation. So it has this kind of interesting, as some of you may know, an agricultural history to it. The sort of way in which you are gonna cultivate and make new types of things. So to me, why that got me interested was um, reading, if you Google or search in um, any kind of archives for the category of parent, it doesn't show up as a vocabulary term in prescriptive manuals about what a mother or a father might do until the 1920s. So to me, that's very interesting that at the very moment, that it becomes more propounded as a science, a particular technology. Here's how you make a good child. Doesn't appear in the literature until the 20th century. So what are people doing before then? They're creating kinds of communities. They're trying to get you know, literal animal subjects into some civilized reality. So I'm trying to actually speak about how the vocabulary of it changes over time itself. I am using a very contemporary term, parenting, which would have been unrecognizable to somebody in 1870. That doesn't mean that there weren't mothers or fathers. It means that that is an activism. So I am trying to take that word and say, Parenting, a word we all use very naturally as a description for our habitus, is something relatively new and attached to this plot line of the history of religions I'm trying to describe. And I guess just another additional question, another way of asking what I said before is why, why are you focusing on parenting and yeah. not the family or parents? Right, because to me the, the, the activism is in the doing of it, that that's what it should be an absorbing practice, that there's no part of your life that would not be marked out. This project began for me when I was with a, a friend um, from college, a philosophy major in college, who gave me a 40-minute monologue about those nooks, those things that you put into the mouth of babies. They say N-U-K on I think that's the brand name. They're just little, you know, this little sucker. I mean, you know, but like, pacifier. pacifier, that's the word. Thank you. Um, we call them the nook in my world. But like, and so the, she had 40 minutes about whether or not to win and whether to remove the nook. And that was one of the most elaborate descriptions of this is a person who had spoken largely in abstractions for much of it, and now all of a sudden this practice was the source of all cognizance. But to me, that's parenting, therefore, is a practice and, a, and an epistemology. And trying to get at that, is, that, that conjunction is, is to me the, the labor of the project. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Right, the childless. Yes, yes childless. precisely. So are we enacting the moral codes, the hagiography of the child in the same way, or are we bereft about? Uh, th one of the things I'm trying is where does moral life come from absent a parenting practice? I would ask, I would just reflect that back to all of us. Um, yeah. yeah. One more question from the audience. Right. And the return of the parent at the point of having children, to yeah. To raise children. Yeah. What happens when the children they leave the church? Yeah. From the church, what do they? They them the parents stop going as often. Yes. Yeah. So that's the, this is this guy uh, who's devoted his life to starting family life cycles in churches, and once their mm -hmm. kids hit adolescence and they met most of them abandoned, they then fade in adherence. Um, uh, this is a huge life cycle study done out of Georgetown, um, and it seems to be pretty consistent, especially. It, it, it focuses on Protestant and Catholic families, but there's, I know, an analogous one going at Brandeis right now by Wendy Kedge in 
uh, and Jewish families, which I, she's not done with the study yet, so I don't know what and she's the date of the, the study was, was first initial findings in 1997, another set in 2002. So I'm going to take advantage of being the host here and ask the last question. Uh, I'm going to start off with an observation. I just want your yes. reaction, and that is my impression is looking at uh, the way my family operated, and I got to observe it myself as a child, but also more importantly, I had two younger brothers that were a decade younger than I was, so I got to see how my parents interacted right. with them. Uh, my impression is that the way our family worked and the way my parents parented is very similar to the way our daughter is parenting 70 years later. Right. Whereas the striking thing that you said that I didn't realize was that the people in the United States, I guess they were teenagers, had uh, no longer believed that God punished them for their sins. Mm -hmm. Now that is a huge, huge mm -hmm. change where in comparison to what I'd say were subtle differences in parenting in my experience. Right, right, or a cycle of parenting where they're sort yeah. of, you know, one generation does one yeah. thing, another one does another, and then one rebels they, by going to a more orthodox. You're saying they both changed yes. a lot. My yeah. impression is the parenting has probably changed a lot less than religious beliefs. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting to think about. I, that's not what I have found that parenting has changed a lot less, but I do interest, I'm interested in that cycle of, of obedience, disobedience, obedience, disobedience. Yeah. yeah well, we'll see. Okay, yeah. well, that was a lot of fun. Let me uh, thank Katie. <laughs> Number two. Thank all of you for coming and asking so many excellent questions. Number three, I'd like to extend two invitations. One, to come to our reception, which is next door in the common room. And the second invitation is to come back on April 2nd for something completely different. <laughs> Paul Tipton, who's the new chair of our physics department, is going to talk about whether the taxpayers of the world got their money's worth in paying for the discovery of the Higgs boson. It ought to be a really interesting discussion with both scientific and, and uh, sociological questions that he's, he's raising. So I invite you to come back then. Thank you. <clears throat>